Okay, I think we can get started now. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today we have a talk on the black kite, which is perhaps the most common raptor that we find here in India. The talk is going to be presented by Nishant Kumar and Urvi Gupta. Nishant is a visiting fellow at the Department of Zoology at the University of Oxford and a postdoctoral researcher at the Wildlife Institute of India. He studies the urban ecology of the black kite in Delhi. Urvi is a wildlife enthusiast since childhood and is currently working at the project, as a project biologist with the Wildlife Institute of India. She has a background in zoology from Delhi University and a master's in biodiversity, conservation and management from Oxford. Over to you, Nishant and Urvi. You can share your screen. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for the introductions, Kavi. I'm going to share the screen now. Can someone confirm that it's visible? Yes, it's clear. Okay. Uh, very warm and virtual welcome to Delhi. Uh, if you've crossed the Delhi border while entering or exiting Delhi via the NH1 or the Ghazipur side, you must have come across the huge mountains of garbage. This is the Ghazipur landfill where we've been frequenting since 2012. Every day, 500 truckloads of garbage are uh, deposited over here. And this site that you see are not starling murmurations, but a congregation of black kites on your screen. And this is pretty common from October, November till April. And we were all just very fascinated as to why are they so common in these winter months and not in summer months. And uh, what's the, what, what's, what role does this garbage play, especially after the decline of vultures? So I'd ask Nishant on, here on his beginning of the kite project and how, uh, why should we observe these birds which are so common that sometimes we just forget to notice them in the environment although this is a pretty unusual sight for the, uh, to see this huge congregation but these birds are pretty common even in our vicinity just go to your balcony and see upstairs and in a few minutes we are sure to see one so Nishant here, up to you Okay, thank you Urvi for the nice introduction. And I had a meaning to request Urvi to start this, considering that I am a visitor to Delhi. I came to Delhi in the year 2004, while Urvi and many Delhi Heights must have observed these landfills on the three borders of Delhi. They were instituted by the municipality by the end of 1980s. And they are quite a conundrum in context of how we deposit our waste. So a common question which people often ask me, and it includes citizens as well as experts with whom I work, they always ask, why do we need to study kites? And I need to discuss with you all the motivation of humans in general it is divided into two different contexts. One is to identify, or in humans in general, we identify discontinuities in our environment. One way is to ascribe specific status. And ascribing specific status is not new in context of how Homo sapiens sapiens evolved. It might be quite recent in the history of humanity that we have a list of scientific names but our ancestors have been giving these names for years and thousands of years altogether. I have a, an interesting story from the life of Ernst Meyer to discuss with you all. When he was a young PhD student, and mind you that he completed his doctorate in just 18 months, people who are not aware of Ernst Meyer can relate to him in context of his pen name or his pseudonym being, or people popularly call him as Darwin of 21st century. So he went on to study birds of paradise in Papua New Guinea. 
and he identified 127 different species of birds of paradise. Definitely to the to surprise Ernst Meyer enough, the local tribes at Papua New Guinea, they already had 126 names and they were quite distinct from each other. So in reality, Maya added just one new species for the lot of people who are inhabiting that part of our world. It explains a lot in context of how much we need to acquire from the common people. And that's why the congregation or the virtual congregation we have here, wherein there are few experts and most of us are enthusiasts in this context as well count really long uh, to the much larger extent than other animals who could do it. Crows, for instance, can count as well till nine as per the literature available. So I also would like to discuss the connotation of identification of discontinuities in our environment. We have an innate ability to classify and that classification is hurting the world currently. It has hurt us for centuries and thousands of years and somehow our ethical paradigms allow us to save people or save people from oppressed races, classes and similar categories which humans have defined for over thousands of years. So classification in general has its benefits and classifications without ethics in context of human sections is something we all need to build up and take a resolve to solve the issues. So a sense of identification of species and numbers allows humans to have an innate affinity with animals in and around them. E.O. Wilson, a famous lot from a famous scientist from Harvard University calls this biophilia, which means an innate ability in humans to love organisms. In this part of the world, in South Asia, we also have kind of galvanized this ability to appreciate backyard biodiversity through religiously ground philanthropic or patronage activities. Quite often in our backyards, we can see people offering food to all different kinds of animals. And this repeated time and again over thousands of years and through coexistence develops into socio-ecological relationships, which is the crux of our focus of research. On this slide, we have the old world depicted out here, wherein there are two major colors, orange and yellow. They are depicting the distribution range of our model species on which we conduct our research. Towards the northern side, the orange color depicts the populations which migrate down whenever there is permafrost in wind season. And the color in yellow depicts the resident species of black guides. There are seven of them, and in India we have two. The circle in red represents our focal zone currently. Over to you, Urvi. Uh, I'm sure a lot of us would be wondering as to what the ranges means, what is the significance of these borders, because birds are free to fly anywhere. So it would be nice if you could also elaborate on that. Perfect. Thank you. So, shayad bachpan se hab sam sunte aaye hain. Apologize. I will apologize to people who probably do not understand Hindi. I will translate it alongside. हम सभी बचपन से सुनते आए हैं कि पंछियों हवा और नदियों की कोई सरहद नहीं होती सो आउट हियर वी कैन सी फ्यू बॉर्डर्स एंड बर्ड्स विंड एंड रिवर्स आर डिस्क्राइब्ड इन पोइम्स एंड लिटरेचर एज समथिंग विच डू नॉट रिस्पेक्ट बॉर्डर्स सो द बॉर्डर्स विच यू कैन सी एट द जंक्शन ऑफ येलो एंड ऑरेंज आर नॉट देयर इन रियालिटी इट इज एक्चुअली 
a continuum of multiple populations interacting with each other, at times competing with each other to capitalize on the limited resources which are available. In case of birds and raptors in particular, which are birds of prey, it is largely focused on two major resources, a strong large tree where they can nest. I'm talking of the tree nesting raptors. There are other groups as well. And the food which they consume in the area which they define as their territory. Urvi, over to you. Um, so this map shows uh, their migration, their migration route from Central Asia to India. We've tried to highlight uh, based on our telemetry data on their movement from uh, the Central Asian steppes, which is in Mongolia, South of Russia and Kazakhstan and how they, the sort of geographies that they might be crossing. So one of them is the Taklakman Desert in North China, which is the size of Germany. And then they enter India, like the population that we study enters India through Leh and Ladakh and come to, the, to our city, which is Delhi, and help in providing some really important ecosystem services of scavenging. And this has been going on for centuries. Uh, even before uh, humans were present. But what's interesting is that in the last few years, urbanization and our uh, waste disposal practices have changed landscapes and have provided them with very different foraging opportunities. And now it's really interesting to see how these kites are being impacted by us. Thank you, Urvi. Isn't it fascinating because this well uh, this image with very high definition allows us to differentiate the geographical paradigms from north towards the place where we all are listening to each other. And while humans have changed, their habitations have changed, our habits have changed, birds and animals continue to adapt to our needs. So we kept this slide early on in the presentation to illustrate that the later part of the talk, after we have, uh, would focus on the migration aspect and would relate a perspective on how these kind of movements of animals in response to humanistic changes might be a cause of concern. And mind you, we all are already facing the repercussions of similar concern in the form of COVID-19 lockdown. Urvi. So with this, we'd like to begin officially our research project that's been going on in Delhi since 2012 in collaboration of Wildlife Institute of India, University of Oxford and the Spanish National Research Council. We'll take this moment to uh, thank our supervisors and our field team who've been mentioned over here. And let's begin with uh, the story of black kites in Delhi. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, the fact that when we start researching an organism, it's really important to know what their population status is, especially for conservation implications in the future. So to study the population of black kites, we, the, uh, the beginning was to see how many nests were there to estimate the nesting density. Can you shift to the next slide? Yeah. So uh, Delhi, as we know, has different gradients of urbanization from urban greens, which are our parks and semi-natural forests, our city forests, to extremely urban places with no trees at all. There are a couple of them in East Delhi and West Delhi. So in 2012, we had about eight sampling plots, one square kilometer each. And over the last seven years, we keep adding more and more sites to cover as much Delhi as possible. And this map has representations of those sites that we've been sampling. We, as a team, we start beginning, uh, we start our surveys in October or November when uh, the resident kites, the Milvis migrants Govinda begin their nesting activities. So we sample, we comb each site thoroughly, looking at any sort of nesting behavior, starting from the territorial uh, behavior of the pair to nest building activities. 
and then our uh, lovely field team would climb the nest and place candle traps they would count the number of eggs and the chicks and we'll follow these nests over the next few days till they have fleshed out to know what their outcome is to see how successful these nests are meanwhile we also follow their behavior and their diet and over these years we i think our uh, sampling effort has been pretty impressive for a raptor this size perfect thank you so for the part of our viewer group who are not very or who somehow do not like much of the technical discussion i would give an analogy in context of an alien possibly trying to understand humans in delhi so whenever i used to do a reconnaissance survey in delhi during my third semester of masters of my master degree course in wildlife institute of india people used to suggest me to reach gazipur and do the sampling if i wanted to study kites so of course it is not true if somebody wants to study humans and how well humans are doing in the city of delhi one needs to factor slums one also need to needs to factor lithian delhi and all other configurations of class economics and socio cultural connotations so similarly we take into account all the possible resource gradients formed by the social expressions of humans and the physical signatures humans leave on the face of national capital region and we have about 30 of these units which we follow an interesting aspect to discuss would be the need of supervision and mentorship when a student tries to establish a project out of his head so this project was conceptualized during a seminar on population ecology with professor jhala who is on this side of the screen and professor kureishi so they suggested what i was trying to present on the behavior and population paradigms of raptors and i was trying to relate it with my undergrad undergrad project of second year bsc and they suggested to do a kind of proper survey before i speculate about the kite changes or the change in kite numbers in context of the decline in vultures of course subsequently the research started under the formal supervision of the dr dhananjay mohan and subsequently dr fabrizio sergio joined in and for my doctorate i had dr andrew gosler who was my main supervisor so collectively the stream of supervisors gave us very different targets it was not easy to begin with i'm not sure how young researchers of my age or even the experienced one if they can recall their yester years adjusted with their supervisors i could define them into multiple categories so starting with possibly andy or dhananjay sir they were very happy with whatever small i could manage because they have extensive experience on working with birds and at times you do not get enough samples so dhananjay mohan sir said that even if i do 25 nests for my master dissertation he would be a happy supervisor subsequently i had fabrizio sir who said 80 to 100 is doable in context of the densities you probably have in your system because he was the kite expert and he allowed us to lay the fulcrum of the project on the top i had instructions from dr jhala and professor kamal kureshi to at least do something more than 100 nests so you can actually imagine the plight of a young student who tries to tie six poles of bamboos back to back you can probably see it here we are trying to do it in one fine morning of december with an idea to sample the nests of kites which are on average 10 meters or higher so we used to climb odd structures at times we did try to go up on a tree and once this structure was tied well it was tough to maneuver ourselves on the road at times we used to cause traffic jams and 
associated ruckus. Luckily, we got a poll subsequently, which could be extended and no more bang yeah. bang around. So such kind of studies need a very vital support of people who associate, who, who organically got associated with project. And of course, the hero of the project to start with was Lakshmi Narayan. His pseudonym is Vishnu. And somehow we could accomplish it in the first season itself. A sample of 151 nests, well sampled every week. So when I started to understand the nuances of how one should be doing raptor ecology or study raptor ecology, a manual on raptor ecology said, a study on raptor only depends on three things. Sample size, sample size, sample size. And after my reconnaissance survey, I could say yes, yes, yes. But of course, it was not so sweet. And it was a very tiring journey to move from nest to nest every week, trying to sample the behavior and breeding status of these birds. Because in order to understand the success of any population, you need to check the breeding component. How well is a breeding unit performing? can inform a lot on an average about the status of a population. Of course, in order to understand the movement behavior of these birds, we also started putting transmitters from the second season onwards, which ideally looks like this when placed on the back of the bird after we tie it using a harness, much like how you wear your backpack on your own back. Over to you, Urvi. Um, so uh, with, now we move on to the initial stages of the paper where we discuss where we started finding out what the density and the basic uh, biology of the black kite is. This was pretty much unknown for us before the study except for a few papers, a uh, few studies which were done in the 1960s and 1970s. I think we've got a huge advantage uh, that there were uh, a few studies done in Delhi Zoo and by a Russian professor in 1970s on the population status of these birds. And now 2012 onwards, we are doing ours. So if, uh, if we move to the next slides, we could also see the comparisons and talk about how the city has changed and how the population of black kites have changed and are responding to these uh, city changes. Thank you. So irrespective of the people we talk to, experts or non-experts, a vital connection which we all feel, I think it surpasses the connection overall in context of tigers. So, Amongst conservationists and wildlifers, tigers are either a topic of hate because tigers get a lot of fund. So search groups which do not fund crib about the funds which tiger has or tiger conservation program has. Or of course we have tiger conservationists who have a, a huge burden of maintaining a viable population of these top predators in our tiger reserves. So much to my own surprise because you seem lost as a wildlifer when you start a study of this kind in the mega city of Delhi. So in general, in our national parks, we hold some relevance as wildlifers wearing a hat with a GPS unit in your, hat, in your hand. And you can imagine a typical, how a typical wildlifer looks. But, but we when I used to, yeah. <laughs> So when we used to board buses or metros in Delhi, we used to look quite awkward, especially with the telescopic pole in our hand, which we subsequently could gather. So because of the mirror, which was attached to one end of it, people used to ask questions as simple or as benign as, Aap isse kya banate ho? because there was a mirror attached and they used to bother if we were barbers who were moving across in the city, shaving, pe shaving off people's beard or something. Selfie, so, selfie stick. Uh, the other thing was selfie stick for sure. And I think selfie stick got quite popular after 2015 onwards, but Black Kite Project people had a six meter long selfie stick from the beginning of the project itself in 2012. So, yep. The question which keeps haunting us in context of how well people relate with common species around them 
is their interest in the status of vultures and how come we have lost sparrows in and around us. And of course, there were scores of stories about it. And I would request Urvi to focus on this aspect of relationship with what people discussed about towards the later part of the project. But now on, the main question was, vultures ko kya hua, giddha ko kya hua. And there was so much confusion in the common people in context of the colloquial names which people use for vultures and kites. So people interchangeably used to address each other. And they were really bothered about the loss of vultures and sparrows. And I'm sure the viewers want an answer in context of how kites have responded after the loss of vultures. A 1970 based study by Vladimir, Vladimir Golishin from Russia informs that black kites were the predominant breeding raptors in Delhi. 83% of the nests he sampled in 150 square kilometer of Delhi in 1968 to 70 was, constitu was constituted by black kite pairs. Only 5% of the nests were of vultures. It is sad that we do not have records of how vultures or kites behaved after that, but all of us probably by and large understand that we lost vultures by the turn of the century. So the loss of vultures has not been registered in the overall density of black kites in Delhi. It stays somewhere around 15 to 20 nests per, per square kilometer. But I would need to put certain caution in context of the breeding sector and the non-breeding sector of this population. So over the last seven and eight years, we have only been able to focus on the breeding section of the population. And we are putting in a lot of efforts to put tarsal bands on the legs of these birds and wing tags. We are putting transmitters on the back of these birds to understand the non-breeding component. And of course, there is a huge population which winters a huge population of black-eared kites which enters winters in our landscapes. So in order to respond very critically about the behavior of kites in context of vultures, we need to wait and do a thorough study of the two segments of these populations. And of course, as we are talking of landfills and garbage, you would like to have basic thorough run of how we do samplings on the landfills of Delhi because we, for, we were prepared yeah. for zoonotic diseases even before the COVID-19 came. Yeah, so the picture here is not from COVID-19 era. It is from February 2013. And you can see my supervisors instructing me to be prepared to dig a trench one meter deep and try to find out why kites must be consuming in there. And we were prepared to do 3D modeling, but this was the beginning slope of this landfill. And my supervisors were quite excited. Slowly we started to ascend and on the top of this landfill, we understood that it was quite tedious to actually do a proper 3D modeling of the structure of the dump and relate the number of kites with the resources which are available under them. Resources in context of dead and decaying carcasses and garbage. Urvi, I think it's best that you explain this. Uh, it's very relatable. <laughs> so my first day on kite project was uh, on the 31st of December, New Year's Eve. I woke up at 6.30. It was a foggy evening, a foggy morning, sorry. And I took the metro to the very surprise of my parents, uh, for whom I was somebody who they could not tolerate stench. And I'm not an early riser. And to be at Ghazipur counting black kites from after a pretty long trek to the top of the dump, followed by a lunch out on a bridge which was located outside. And I think this has become a sort of a tradition for recruiting a lot of new people that it's not all uh, pretty things in wildlife and conservation. We really need to get our hands dirty because uh, waste management and scavengers are as much part of an ecosystem and conservation issue as any other species, uh, endangered species. 
So this uh, garbage dump has been uh, a test for anybody who's coming to the Black Kite project for the past seven years. Thanks, Urbi. It was specifically important for us to have this as a testing ground for new volunteers because when I joined YLF Institute of India, I got to learn from my seniors that Professor Qureshi and Professor Jhala test the new recruits by moving them around carcasses, which they locate in the middle of a jungle, probably a carcass of an animal which was predated by a tiger or a leopard. So we test the metal of enthusiasts into the wildlife sector by taking them or uh, by paying a visit to this dump. It is important for me to address the youngsters from the group who are viewing us that from a distance, the sector of wildlife may sound very appealing. And of course, there is a lot of glamour and passion associated with it. So it's best to expose yourself to projects around you in order to understand, can you sustain this passion through these hardships? For instance, Urvi has been with us ever since she joined and she has shown a lot of personality changes. My supervisors probably can assess me in context of how much of personality change have I shown to adjust into a city system, even when I'm trained as a wildlife biologist. So these kind of adjustments are needed in your career as a wildlife biologist. And at times when the globalized system of the world is facing so many atrocities and probably would force more atrocities like COVID-19, we need our citizens also to be better informed in context, in context of collating more opinions about what they feel about animals around. And it definitely has a lot of meaning for a country like India, which has 1.4 billion, roughly 1.4 billion people. And we house a substantial portion of biodiversity nested within the human habitations. So, so Urvi would summarize the perspective on why we were interested after we learned that there was no major change in the overall density of black kites. Why was it necessary for us to identify the preferences which a pair of a black kite would rather place in order to identify the best nest, the best tree in the nest, sorry, the best tree in the city to place its nest. Over to you, Urvi. Uh, when we were conceptualizing uh, the decision-making process of a kite on their nest selection, uh, we were given, we were told that they might just be breeding anywhere, any artificial pylon, there's too many nesting structures for them, there's food everywhere, which was sort of true, there's food everywhere, there are so many kites, and yet, not every tree in Delhi has a nest in it, nor does every pylon in Delhi. So uh, we start, we, we thought is to, there must be some preferences of areas and trees, tree structures, the habitat structures that the kites may be choosing. And uh, we started comparing our existing nests with some computer generated random points. I think those random point selection has been the toughest part of my black kite history till now. Uh, <laughs> moving around in Delhi on foot in the June heat to any random computer generated GPS point to compare that particular tree or nesting structure and its components with another tree that had a nest on it. And eventually we realized that it's, it's important for kite to focus on food and its habitat, which is pretty obvious. And the, our data started showing this, that uh, not every part of Delhi is equally suitable. Some of them would act as ecological traps where there's enough food resources, but there won't be enough trees for them to house. So they'll possibly choose an elect, uh, a pylon where the predation rates would increase or you know, the heat, uh, they won't be able to uh, have the shade of a canopy to protect them. Can you move to the next slide? 
possibly also can talk about potential predators yeah so these uh, so as we were talking about predation we after uh, they don't have uh, uh, there's no other raptor bigger than black kite uh, so they after putting camera traps we found that they they do get predated by owls and monkeys and crows and there's a lot of intrusion by rats and pea fowl as well in lots of places so not all nests get, are successful for these kites so can the viewers really imagine this much going behind in their backyard when an odd bird is trying to place itself or to define delhi as its home it has to undergo so much of challenges while it opportunistically capitalizes on the resources of course provided by humans a vital aspect of our research which could relate the nesting criteria of black kites in delhi was meat chunks which people of islamic faith used to toss philanthropically so irrespective of caste creed religion in this part of the world people have an innate response or association or a learned response to be associated with birds and many different species of animals and philanthropically offer them food towards the top right corner you can see a meat chunk in the talon and isn't it a daily treasure hunt so what was just depicted diagrammatically in the previous slide can be imagined in reality here so for once try and put your head around as if you were the occupants of the nest which sandra and jose are occupying so these names have been given by one of our latest interns from canada and we have to give these kind of connotations when you're dealing with tough and mundane task of extracting information from the images which are collected by trail cameras which work 24/7 and record every movement of these birds so these birds need to go down on a treasure hunt identify the locations which might give them food and mind you that the male needs to do this for initial 60 days of the total 90 day breeding cycle and covid-19 is giving us a situation of lockdown and in order to safeguard her nest the female continues to brood and incubate the eggs and chicks for initial 60 days which is virtually the lockdown so how do kites actually manage this kind of treasure hunt in a city which is as complex as visible on the screen so it happens by the experience which these long lived birds gain as juveniles and they delay their breeding for initial 3 to 4 years so in all top predator categories the young ones even when they are sexually mature do not indulge in breeding but rather indulge in understanding the locality and how resource can be defined in context of acquiring those resources and in context of in in context of identifying the best ways or optimal ways to be associated with those resources so yep subsequent focus of our research goal was to identify if initial criteria of what an individual pair identifies gets translated at the level of populations as well so you can see that you can say that for humans as well that on an average if you sample about 1000 people or 10000 people in delhi at random or maybe with a, some plan in head that you will sample some people from this section or the other section would that be able to define the whole population of delhi or similarly if such kind of sampling practices have allowed us to understand the population structures in humans and i think these sampling strategies have been used for hundreds of years all together and we wanted to understand a similar relationship in individual choices or and whether or not they are linked with population level observations so populations are best depicted in context of the densities at which they are existing a real dense population is a good hint of the relationship with the resource and in this case we wanted to understand the relationship of the resource which is philanthropically offered as meat chunk to kites which forms about 
80% of kites die when they are nesting. You can see that the kite takes the meat chunk back to its nest and it is utilized to feed its young ones for nearly 60 days of its association with the nest. So if you want to see areas which have high nesting densities, you need to figure out where there's availability of free food, like areas where the meat chunks are being tossed and there's a huge woodland space, like an urban park, or a woodland, and in, if, when these two are when these two places are beside each other, then the possibility that you'll find high kite nesting densities are pretty high. Perfect. So I'm not sure whether or not we are keeping the interest goals of our viewers at pace, but I would like to address the pe address people who are not professionally associated with research that research work is relatable to many forms of human creativity. And it, it includes observation, imagination, and rectification, which is part of all similar human endeavors of creativity. So a basic idea of how a researcher works can be compared with how a tailor tries to understand the potential size of the wearer of the shirt or a suit which he is trying to stitch. So most of us are wearing ready-made garments these days and we can relate with the activity of a tailor who stitches ready-made garments. He uses wooden models and his imagination to stitch the best suit. Similarly, researchers go on field and observe. They make logical hypotheses, these logical explanations which are for hypotheses and then they are tested under scientific paradigm. The test of scientific paradigm needs mathematical knowledge and statistical knowledge. And what you get as an outcome of a research has to undergo a satisfaction of all these small litigatory processes. So we would request viewers to focus on this particular research paper, which came out in Frontiers for Young Minds, which informs in a nutshell how kites and other birds become very successful group of bird, group of animals in a human dominated landscape. So this is in a nutshell for people who wish to understand it visually on the left side of the screen is a zoomed in criteria of what a breeding kite likes to identify. So a breeding kite likes to identify a very strong large tree. So initially when we started this project, people expected kites to nest everywhere, wherever they could find food, which was not the criteria. Only 5% or lesser number of nests on, were available on towers. So kites would like to identify a large tree where they can place a relatively large nest for a bird which has a wingspan of about five feet. And it needs to identify food units, preferably in the older establishments. So it is not much of a guess that those establishments in Delhi, which are historic and with good green cover, are utilized by kites for nesting. And there you can find the nesting densities as high as 180 nests per square kilometer. And in many sections of the city, which are far from such kind of locations, which are far from availability of either philanthropically tossed food or food from daily available garbage or what kites predate on. So kites also predate on rodents and pigeons and very birds which are quite numerous in the city. So when such kind of forage is not available on the northwest and the western sections of the city, the nest densities in the areas which we sample there are often zero nests per square kilometer. Uri, would you like to explain about the attack behavior of these kites? I think uh, whenever I speak with somebody about kites, then the most common urban legend that comes around is that if you look at them directly, they will steal away your eyes, they'll snatch your eyes away. And uh, a lot of people from, from my parents' generation talk about how their school lunches, how their lunches during school times would get stolen away by kites. But luckily, we have never experienced it. 
but we've experienced some really aggressive fights even though we neither of us lost their eyes we've experienced uh, a lot of attacks we've got tattoos on our heads and this usually happens when the kites have started uh, building nests and their eggs starts hatching out and their chicks starts growing up so what what do you think is the highest uh, number of attacks on one nest on one single day people can type that in the chat boxes how many times can a kite potentially try and attack a human being who is trying to fiddle with the nest or like researchers like us or somebody who dares to go too near into the vicinity of the tree so the highest number we've got till now is 25 to be honest that uh, is nowhere 100 okay 100 is pretty close because the maximum number of times our field assistants got attacked was uh, 110 on one nest in sagarpur whose image we showed a couple of minutes ago within one check which took about 25 minutes so they are pretty uh, aggressive birds and we then had to see why what makes those birds aggressive when does their aggression peak what are the factors that contribute to this behavior so i guess if you move to the next slide we have more pictorial representations to explain yeah. that okay i would take on from here so i would like to share a small story about the field work in connection to this image so this image was taken by dr fabrizio sergio who stayed on a rooftop facing a kite nest right in front of him for close to 8 to 10 hours and then only you can get something as beautiful as this i'm very sure the set of viewers who are watching us right now would associate with the amount of patience they showcase to get a simple good picture and i can't even describe the kind of patience needed for something as exquisite as this so quite often fabrizio because he is not an indian he used to face a common question aap nadjio se ho ya discovery wale ho and initially he tried to say no i am a basic researcher but over the time he came up with an explanation so jo unse puche aap discovery se ho used to say no i am from nadjio and if somebody used to say aap nadjio se ho you said no i am from discovery and then people used to say okay convinced another aspect which is very important in context of a kite and flight is relatable with my first takes uh, your sampling in season 1 and we met a policeman who said that चील कहाँ है चील तो गायब हो गई सो आई वॉज लाइक वॉट इज द स्टाफ विच इज फ्लाइंग ओवर हैड इस सर ये तो बाज है एंड आई सेड प्रॉब्ली यू कॉल यू आर ड्रेस काइट्स कलोकियली एज बाज बट इट इज कॉल्ड चील इन लार्ज पार्ट ऑफ इंडिया सो ही सेड नहीं ये बाज है ये सब कुछ उड़ते हुए करता है ये बैठता ही नहीं ये खाता भी है सब कुछ सो ही हैड एन इनवर्टेड कॉमर अराउंड सब कुछ एंड वाइल ही वॉज एक्सप्लेनिंग ऑल दिस सब कुछ आई पॉइंटेड टू अ काइट विच वॉज पर्श ऑन अ लाइट पोस्ट नियर बाई आई सेड वो जो बैठ गया वो क्या है सो बोला जो बैठ गया वो बाज नहीं सो यू गेट ऑल दीज फनी कॉन्वर्टेशन एज अ रिसर्च इन अगेसिटी आई थिंक द काइट इज द मोस्ट a uh, misnamed uh, most wrongly recognized bird especially when it comes to english like i think majority people in delhi call them eagle like they'll not believe that it's a black guy yep i would guess we would spend 2 minutes towards the end of this talk to discuss specifically the whole conundrum of naming these common birds around us so definitely i would request viewers to stay on for the end of this presentation and in context of the attacks it was quite evident to us that we could classify them in three different categories the first category where in a good num number of nests where we could identify no response from black kites they used to move away from the nesting areas and a substantial number of birds used to hover around an alarm a 
quarter of the nests or about 30% of the nests were associated with severe attacks. And of course, these birds used to alarm as well. And a basic analysis was based, a basic analysis to define this attack behavior was based on the idea of the cost to defend. So such kind of behaviors develop in a city and it is not a big guess to understand that it would be dependent on the nest content. Of course, we found that it was more likely for the kites to attack humans if their nest had more number of eggs and chicks. And if those chicks were sure to fledge out as young ones, the birds which were associated with human dominated systems or built up areas were also more aggressive. And the birds which interacted with humans on a regular basis in terms of taking out stuff from garbage to eat or even snatching up meat pieces, media, which were meat pieces which were offered philanthropically to them. So this habituation allowed a set of birds to get to respond aggressively to a potential intruder. And of course, you would understand that this is a costly behavior. And we wanted to understand why this cost could be associated with a behavior which is persistent. And it was identified that the birds which were very aggressive also used to release most number of young ones from their nests. So this is how the behavior comes down vertically in the population and it survives because it has payoffs. And now, of course, with focus on the next portion of our talk, for which many of you must be waiting, is on the migratory behavior of these black kites from Central Asia to the Indian subcontinent region where we all are listening to each other. Professor Jan Newton published a book on migration ecology of birds, and he highlighted a red question mark in context of the connections of flyways. Flyways are the usual paths or very traditional paths taken by scores of birds which move from northern latitude towards equators. And this happens in the winter season. And soaring birds are specifically important because they have wide wings and they utilize the thermals which are formed once the ground gets hot. So hot ground leads to thermals of airs which help the birds to rise. And this is the phenomena which explains a certain species which crosses the Mount Everest. So is it not surprising for you to know that even black kites do these trans Himalayan mountains? I guess Urvi would put a bit of perspective on the data which we can, which we all can access on eBird. Over to you, Urvi. I think uh, most of us over here would be familiar with the eBird and I'm assuming a lot of you also contribute uh, very regularly to this platform. So last year we sat down and saw uh, the data for these birds and uh, the, these images show data from 1975 to 2019 that uh, uh, in uh, the period between June and July, which is the breeding season for black beard kites, they are mostly in the Central Asian steppes. And, uh, and in the next slide, which is the December to February, which is the wintering period in India, we find them in India. So this shows that there are huge populations of black eared kites within Central Asia, and they are migrating to different parts of the country, not just Delhi, but everywhere else as well. There are reports from South India, from Mysore, from uh, Mumbai, uh, from the dumps of Mumbai and Gujarat, and also from Assam. There's a group in Mongolia which frequently tags, uh, puts wing tags on black eared kites, and we've spotted them in, uh, in our uh, part of the city. And uh, it's, it's really fascinating to see that they are capable of uh, flying over such huge uh, distances. And what's even more interesting is that when we had uh, put uh, GPS tags and we were looking at their home ranges when they were in their uh, breeding grounds, which was in Central Asia, each bird occupies a large area, but closer home uh, in uh, Wait, 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 I think we'll wait for that slide to come, Urvi. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
this is uh, Lakshmi, which is the first uh, black-eared kite that was tagged in Delhi. And there's a very interesting story to it that when we caught it, we didn't know it was a black-eared kite. It looked very similar to the Govinda resident uh, subspecies. And after we tagged it and released it, it took a circumference of Delhi and we were like, okay, it's flying around Delhi. It will eventually go to its nest or maybe it's a floater. It will just stay around. And then it started going northwards. It started flying towards Chandigarh and then to Himachal. And then we lost its signal and we were going crazy as to why it's now in Ladakh. And then we, that's when we realized that, okay, it's not our resident bird, it's a black-eared kite. I think that also caught Fabrizio sir by a lot of surprise. Yeah, so him. he expected to tag a bird within Delhi and understand its movement. And of course, it was a happy surprise. The Journal of Bombay Natural History Society, it has scores of articles which mention this north to south movement of Lineata subspecies of this bird or this species. But we were not very sure if those huge number of birds were associated with our landfills. So it, has, it will be discussed in context of our current lockdown situation. This is how typically we trap a black kite in Delhi in a mist net. And then we put the transmitter on the back of the bird. If you can notice it on the lower right corner. And with a generous support from Raptor Research and Conservation Foundation, Mumbai, who have been our main funders in 2018 and in 2017, 18. So a part of the grant also came from microwave telemetry and we fixed about 20 transmitters on a sample of birds we trapped from landfills. We did not know if these birds would come back to these landfills. But of course, if you check the pre-breeding and post-breeding migratory routes, you could see that these birds could actually identify the places from where they were tagged. An interesting aspect would be to compare the size of their wintering area, which is depicted in green, and the area in their breeding territories. It's huge, 85 times larger than the green area. So it signifies how much humans have changed the provenance and movement of these birds in context of how and where these wintering populations identify resources. So these birds have innate behaviors or the behaviors which they have by birth and they acquire this knowledge over the 30 year or more number of uh, 30 or more years of lifespan which they have. So down the line, it would be interesting to get further support from Raptor Research Conservation Foundation to understand the impacts of the distribution of these birds due to human food subsidies. A vital aspect to discuss in context of these migratory movements would be the silk route which flanks this path at two different places. It was interesting for these kites, for, it was interesting to note that these kites moved down to the valley of the Hotan River when they were moving towards their native regions. And on their return, they used to focus, their roots used to focus on a town called Urumki. And both these towns are there on the Silk Route. So imagine 5,000 years of history of recorded history of humans. And we have no idea how kite populations and similarly migratory populations of facultative scavengers or opportunistic scavengers and obligate predators have behaved with various changing regimes of human settlement. This slide has a specific focus in context of the charm a bird of this size brings, <coughs> sorry. So we could notice that pretty much like other famous birds who make very monumental migrations, black kites were crossing Himalayas at the altitude of 6,500 meters. At these altitudes, you have temperatures ranging from minus 20 to minus 25. And can you imagine an odd bird hovering in your backyard actually accomplishing this feat of moving across these multiple barriers of nature. So it starts from 
Trans Himalaya as it follows with the Taklamakan Desert, which is of the size of Germany. And then there are multiple barriers. I would so, request Urvi to summarize the breeding and wintering migratory journeys for our viewers. So uh, when they move from Delhi to Central Asia, the average duration of the journey is about three weeks and the route of the length of the route is about 4,000 kilometers. And uh, if you see the difference between the speed, the, uh, they are pretty speedy while going because they have to go and acquire their breeding territory in the north. While they are coming down, it takes a little longer. It takes about four weeks and a shorter length as well as per our uh, analysis. And they take a little leisure while coming down, I guess. It also depends on the wind speeds during those times. And there's no urgency except for the climatic conditions and the need to procure food. Yeah. Okay. When, when coming to Delhi, they don't have to worry about uh, having a breeding ground, at least not till now. We haven't seen any black-eared kite nest or we haven't been able to prove any signs of hybridization between the two subspecies either. Yeah. So yeah, it is important to focus that the birds who are getting back after summer's start in our part of the world needs to claim the breeding territories in their native regions. And that is why they utilize the wing currents and it is a fantastic journey which starts straight away towards the Himalayan belt and then they follow the Himalayan belt towards the trans-Himalayan region and that's the point where they cross. Of course, there is a recent sad news about migrants moving from urban system or urbanized systems to their native systems. And while these birds, like humans, are moving from these systems or wintering systems to their native systems, they make a lot of stopovers. These stopovers are the points where they refuel. So humans are visitors in many contexts of our, the, time which we, the time we have spent on the globe as a species. And these birds were moving here for thousands and millennia of years. And it is important for the current set of researchers to understand how these human dominated landscapes are changing on either side of Himalayas because the behaviors these birds show, which the behaviors which these birds carry as youngsters would have to be impacted in context of what they encounter in their lifetime. So you saw that these birds are focusing on a landfill in Delhi. And we here we have heard from our colleagues that there are similar congregation of black-eared kites on Devna landfill in Mumbai and a similar landfill in Ahmedabad. So I'm, guess, I'm guessing all top 20 cities would have a similar kind of landfill. And it would be an interesting to understand how foraging in human dominated system impacts them in context of bioaccumulation. So the meat which is available in this garbage is not free of contaminants. And we all have read about basic ideas of bioaccumulation and biomagnification along the food chain, starting from the birds or the prey which a kite consumes or if it is consuming something from the garbage itself. We need to understand the impacts of these contaminants in context of the habitat which kites share with other birds. So all along the migratory journey, these kite populations are associated with so many different species of birds. And the whole conundrum around how and when the microbiome in our bodies can react to these new situations of living lifestyle or in context of how frequently we exchange pathogens from one organism to another should be the crux of the research down the line. So it is important to focus on the black arrow which depicts the migratory journeys which we have followed till now. I just discussed with you Sites which we have tagged since 2014 do not cross the Tibetan plateau. And 
in 2004, an article was published in Journal of Bombay Natural History Society, which informed of the connection of black eyed populations from the eastern part of Mongolia with the eastern part of India. We all understand that Amur falcons also take this route while entering the Indian subcontinent. So isn't it interesting that black kites are entering into the Indian subcontinent with two different paths? So these things excite somebody like me, who is an, a trained ecologist, to understand the ramifications of these population level interactions and how these associations might be utilized to predict the health of not only the this group of birds, but also for many endangered birds, which enter into our subcontinent following the similar route. We have started collaborative discussions with a group which is doing, or which is putting wing tags on the migratory populations from along the West East corridor of Mongolia. And we would request our viewers to report to us if you notice a wing tag, a bird with this wing tag. The ones so we that we are putting are orange in color. And yeah. they also have a phone number in case you get a good look. Otherwise, you can email it to us. We'll leave our, our website and our email IDs at the end of the presentation. And we are also putting a lot of PVC bands and BNHS bands. So in case you're able to find, if you ever spot a bird which has those rings, even though they might not be wing tags, then please let us know via email. Yep. That would be a great help if your keen eyes are able to gather something, some information about this very common group of birds. We would like to end formally the discussion on kites in context of this migratory and resident populations. Considering that we are dealing with a study system circled here in red in context of an interacting resident and migratory populations, we would be able to contribute to the idea of how migration or migratory populations actually originate. Currently, researchers are divided in context of whether it's from a home which was in, tropi which was in tropical system or a home which was there in temperate systems. And this is the last slide, a formal slide in context of the COVID-19 issue. It is important for you to notice how the situation looks like when we put the two entry routes of black kites into the Indian subcontinent. So the research summarized here, done by Zoo and colleagues, relates the population of game birds which are raised, or poultry birds which are raised in our backyards. So India and China are going to contribute to the 98% of the growth in poultry farming. Kites, by the virtue of opportunistic scavengers they are, would of course be associated with these human dominated systems. And these kind of movements and connections might potentially create situations where viruses are transferred from non-human to non-human species. And who knows, one day it might have situations which can threaten human sustenance as well, because we never imagined COVID-19 would hit us as of now. Would you quickly summarize the educational so, component of our research would be. Working in urban areas has an advantage that we get to interact with people a lot from various age groups and various walks of life. So here are some images which are of our initiators with school children and workshops done with them and uh, people from marginalized communities, talking to them about their perspectives on nature as well as telling them about our research and telling them about why they should care about wildlife and what is the importance of raptors in our society, especially vultures and black kites and what their decline means for us. So I think uh, conservation education uh, from our project means a lot to me personally. And I think uh, black kite project has that advantage of reaching out to hundreds and thousands of people in the city. Perfect. Would you like to take this slide, Urbi? So uh, here are some of the volunteers that have worked with us. And we are very proud to say that 80% would be girls. 
and it's it's a huge achievement for us because uh, uh, coming from an urban space myself and uh, from a family where conservation and wildlife is not considered as a conventional career option uh, an urban ecology project does give us a plat platform to pursue our dreams to work with wildlife and apart from me i think it's done that for a hundred other people who worked with us can you request the group of viewers who are still online with us in case they would like to volunteer and how they should be contacting us yeah sure so in case anybody else wishes to volunteer with us and contribute to our project then uh, drop us an email we'll be leaving our email at the end of our presentation and we'll get back to you over that we're always on lookout for new volunteers yep yeah, so sorry for boring you if this was a long presentation it indeed was but this slide in the end depicts the way ahead or the focus of our research group in context of urbanization and disease dynamics at the wildlife livestock human interface in tropical mega cities which are already suffering or which are reeling under the pressure of enormous amount of waste which is sit for us to understand that landscapes which might be relatable in context of the globalized outlook have very specific socio cultural norms these socio cultural norms increase the human contact with animals and this human contact with animals can potentially lead to hundreds of situations which can have very dynamic geographical scale we are under one similar impact called covid-19 and on this slide i would apologize for a lot of terminologies in context of disease names but it roughly exemplifies how so many organismic interactions are happening right under our nose while we cannot factor the ramifications of these interactions specifically in context of enormous amount of waste which is being generated and the spatial change in the amount of waste for instance in 2018 cop declared that meat slaughter or meat slaughter of chickens would not be allowed at gazipur near the gazipur land sale processing unit and that changed the distribution of black eared kites their numbers came down to one third of their usual numbers of 10000 birds which we notice which we have been noticing at the landfill for years all together and we have no idea of the consequences these birds kites in general in one year provide an ecosystem service which is equivalent to clearing the meat of the load of 4000 tons it roughly translates into kites helping humans removing the meat load of 500 elephants from the roads of delhi and this is a vital contribution or disposal of waste by these opportunistic scavengers so while it is good for us to celebrate the coexistence of these opportunistic scavengers in the in our vicinity considering the numbers of humans who are there in these city systems and how rapidly we are changing the human animal landscape it is necessary for the future research groups or the future researchers or potentially younger viewers here who wish to uptake research in future to focus on these questions which can range from some where in the middle of the city to a human dominated landscape which is associated with a protected area so depending upon the taxa you admire or depending upon the human system or wild system you admire human animal interface and sustaining this interface is the next question for the tropical systems especially when we think about human wildlife conflict which is ever growing so i think like pe understanding people's relationships with nature become all the more important yeah can you spend one minute urvi on the crux of your master thesis because it was very interesting for us to notice those trends thank you um i think uh, uh, for conservation it is really important that people appreciate what's near them 
and uh, sometimes because of uh, television and the technological era we have a very stereotype perception of nature which is something out there in jungles and we don't really consider what's in our vicinity as nature so for my master's dissertation i thought i'll explore how people perceive common avian birds especially the scavenging community and compare three groups which was kites crows and vultures which were still very common and see uh, how the extinction of experience has come into play for vultures and if there is an extinction of experience for crows and kites despite them being in our vicinity so was shown a lot of perceptions by uh, people from delhi migrants as well as native people from all walks of life which was very interesting we, uh, sadly like our generation has lost memories of vultures i think we were really young when we started losing them but even the generation just above us have very minuscule memories but our grandparents generation had a lot of rich history and stories to tell us celebrate the uh heritage that vultures had have left us with and to hopefully they'll return soon very surprisingly the uh, actually not so surprisingly the most common uh, memory uh, vision of vultures comes as some as a bird huge bird which is very evil looking and sitting on a carcass in a desert people uh, which discovery and national geographic usually shows as people have forgotten or they don't know people of my generation that delhi was once filled with vultures similarly for kites people sometimes say that kites are uh, you know they are decreasing in numbers or they are increasing in numbers or there are no kites all together they just eat us around here or they have packages and they and they, if you look at them they'll still snatch away your eyes or they'll you know they'll attack you they'll snatch away your food all those memories are pretty vivid uh, in the daily scenario so the crux of your thesis was on stories so i think we'll end our slide here with that message of how stories were important stories are pretty uh, very important so they were more important than the actual ecology of the bird so if, if the best example i can give right now is the example of crows for a lot of people crows are very intelligent birds because everyone has read the story the thirsty crow or the crow in the pitcher where the crow puts pebbles in a pitcher and the water increases but nobody has seen that happen nobody has seen any <laughs> crow do anything intelligent great so yeah over to you so with this we would like to acknowledge our professors at the wildlife institute of india at university of oxford and csic spain and uh, and the team at wii and the forest departments who help us we would like to uh, show our deepest gratitude to our field assistants and our uh, volunteers who have helped us collect data if they are there you can call them maybe they can say hello vishnu and, and of course to raptor research and conservation foundation who have been funding us since 2012 they have played a huge role in supporting us consistently and we are ever so grateful to them along with some of the college microwave telemetry csic and oxford for giving the support Thank so with you a, so, much. so can you guys show your face here sorry i'm spending few seconds here idhar aao na yaar kahan door hello so these are the champions so along with the strong support which we have received from raptor research and conservation foundation which allows us to maintain a strong team these are the real people who allow us to conduct this research a lot of these research stories fail to acknowledge the importance of these enthusiasts who could do many other things in their lives but somehow their motivation has supported us for all these past eight past eight years and we would hope to go on a long run this project has allowed us to become more perseverant in context of how frequently we face questions from people and we are very proud of the amount of conservation education we are able to provide to a whole lot of citizens who are interested to overlook what we are doing in the streets of delhi thanks a lot and this is the last slide which nick asked me to put in the end of the presentation 
it is for the question of the day and viewers can possibly note down this question which they have to respond to this website uh, to this link address you don't have to respond in the chat box it's a simple question which says that kites have a specific special significance one of the famous forts in india can you name the fort and the comment and comment briefly on the significance of the practice as such so people with the best answer would get these goodies so that's it from our side nick uh, over thank to you, you guys thank you kavi yeah thank you. yeah so uh, we've opened up the chat box for all the viewers so in case they have any questions they can type them in the chat box and then i can ask them to you yeah sure. i i have received one privately so maybe i can start with that sure you could just read out the question and yeah. then maybe just answer it yeah so once you, uh, can you please explain if there is any specific difference between vase and the black kite or is it just the name used in different places so uh, would you like to answer that because your research was specifically focused on these questions right. so vase is a name used for falcons in general while chil is used for black kites and kites are facultative scavengers and capable of hunting and falcons from what i perceive mostly hunt and it's not uh, area specific i think uh, when it comes to taxonomy uh, falcons are called vase and kites are called chil but i guess because uh, raptors look pretty similar and for a uh, naive eye they look quite more more similar especially in flight there there is a lot of confusion and in uh, places like delhi where you see more number of uh, kites uh, than any other raptor and you have impact of television where you you know you you listen about uh, falcons you listen about eagles and you listen about vultures so there's a general tendency to confuse their behaviors and then eventually confuse their names as well so crux lies in the idea that the plumage of raptors do not does not vary a lot so in the set of dbf talks there is a talk on raptors for dummies and very categorically the speaker mentioned that it is the identification is tough because of the overlaps with plumage and i think even when birders or very experienced birders make mistakes it is quite common for people to give them one colloquial name to a large group and possibly to mistake one from another thank you great thanks uh, so you nishant you mentioned that talk raptors for dummies so that was by rajneesh and okay. rajneesh is in this presentation and he just asked the question as well so i'll just read it out sure so rajneesh is saying that it is nice to see that there is research even on non glamorous species yep. as all birds tagged seem to have migrated to central asia was selecting individuals of the nominate subspecies a criteria while selecting birds for tagging how long were the birds tracked did any birds over summer and do you have any data on local migration so there are couple, three or four questions if you want you can just look at the chat box and refer to this while perfect on thank you rajneesh is glad that you asked these set of questions and at times we miss many vital points while going through a webinar at times you recall all these points when you are discussing things in person so how long were these birds tracked i think the longest we have tracked is in the tune of 2 years so a lot of these birds die in the course of their migration and we still have seven transmitters which are working and one of the birds out of the 19s which we have followed oversummered but interestingly it did not oversummer completely in delhi so instead of making a north south migration it started moving towards rajasthan at zorbi reserve is it the name would be right yeah it's so towards it went towards bikaner where zorbi reserve is located yeah so in 2014 as we discussed in context of fabrizio insisting on tagging two kites one from the center of delhi and one from the landfill we did not know about the difference in the subspecies so the research group started to understand this actual difference in these two subspecies by the end of 2015 and afterwards our trapping methods were quite focused on these two different subspecies about local migration i would say we have few records of birds wearing tarsal bands moving from their natal area 
to areas which were quite far, about 10 to 15 kilometers. And RRCF, Raptor Research Conservation Foundation, has given us a recent funding to put transmitters on local birds. So within a year or two, we would be, answer, we would be able to answer this question in a, with a better data. So keep tune in to our new research updates on the black kite research. I think there's another, uh, there's another point to this question that uh, if there's a criteria for selecting the birds. So I think the weight of the tags for the resident and local birds would vary because uh, the size of these birds also vary a lot. So we can't put a heavy weighing tag on the resident subspecies. So we do now we are really careful when we have the tag and we know the weight of the tag as to which subspecies we are putting it on. Yep. So on an average, the local subspecies weighs around 700 grams, while the average weight of the birds which come from Central Asia, they weigh around 1200 grams. So roughly two times. So it is, just, it is suggested that you should put three to 4% of the body weight in context of the size of your transmitters. So ideally for the migratory birds, it should not be more than 25 to 30 grams. And for the resident birds, it should not be more than 15 to 20 grams. We are happy to have further questions if okay, they are great. already. Yeah. So we have another question from Prashant, who's asking, yeah. uh, I am curious to know if you have observed any resource competition between free ranging dogs and black kites. Mm -hmm. So as we were discussing the very unique behavior or specificity in context of how the local subspecies feed into the city system and how the migratory subspecies feed, it would be good to for the viewers to understand these landfills and the meat processing units are associated with thousands of kites and in these contexts the amount of wheat, meat is humongously large so in context of the amount of meat there is no evident competition in between the lineatus group and the birds sorry lineatus group and the dogs of course we have seen dogs chasing them which can be a very animal instinctive response from dogs, but there is no evident competition as such because the resource is enormous. In context of the dogs which are there in the streets, it is very less likely for a kite to come and swoop down when the dangers are around. So most likely the local kites or the local resident breeding kites are very accustomed to taking meat chunks mid-air when people are tossing it or when it is safe for them to come and grab away a stuff from the middle of the road. So before a dog realizes that the middle of the city, the morsel is already gone. So there is no clear conflict in between dogs and kites. But of course, I would like to hint that there is an evident conflict in context of where macaques are found and where kites are there. So macaques are a common predatory group on their nesting contents, and they are known to grab black kites mid-air and even smash them back and forth. Yep. Great. I think that's all the time we had for questions right now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nishant and Urvi. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. Please join us again next weekend. We have two very interesting talks by two authors. Uh, we've got Bikram Grewal giving a talk as well as Ranjit Lal. So hope to see you all next weekend. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You everyone. Thank you for having us here. And if there are any questions that we were not able to answer here, then you can email it to us and we can get back to you over there. Right, yeah. Neil. Uh, if you, Nishantri, if you could just go to the slide which has the email IDs and Twitter IDs, then that would be nice if people can note it down. Yeah. yeah. So on the top right corner are the ways that you can reach us.